you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little, about, a little bit about where you're coming from and what your background is? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, you can all see me and hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Joanna Drebby, and I'm currently a, a assistant professor of sociology at Kent State University, although I'm in transition and moving to Albany. So thank you for <laughs> accommodating with this online. You know, I mean, I'm not in Ohio right now. So, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do in my presentation, so I can give you a little more background in a minute. So, how many people are in the audience there? Just so I 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. <coughs> okay, 15. that's cool. Nice to know. I actually can see more people than I thought, so that's great. <laughs> I did this once before. <coughs> oh, so, um, so can you see the PowerPoint okay? Yes. 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 What I did is prepare a kind of a presentation using a PowerPoint. And the one thing um, using the Google Docs is I can't I go through the PowerPoint as slowly as I like. Sometimes I like to have the animation where it comes up a little at a time. So I just apologize in advance. I'm going to, you know, you're going to have a little bit more information there <laughs> coming up. Um, not quite in tune to how I'm talking, but um, I think it's better than nothing, right? So, um, so you're all in training to be teachers, is that correct? No, they are all we teachers are now. Teaching. They are, are in service. Now. Oh, that's great. That's even better. Um, I didn't know that. I thought you were in training. So uh, what levels does everybody work at? We all work in Columbus City Schools. <coughs> okay. Would you like them to introduce themselves? I think that would be great, actually. I didn't realize. Yeah, that's good. So that would be wonderful. That can way you, I can make sure. Okay. Can you see everybody okay? Close enough. That's good. I'm uh, Reginald Carrington. I teach uh, first grade in Columbus and uh, just finished my 25th year. Okay, great. Oh. I'm Casey Sanders. I, I teach elementary vocal music and I'm in my 24th year of teaching. Uh, my name is Roger Braun and I'm a high school science teacher. I'm Julie Apple, and I am a Spanish teacher at the high school level, but I've also taught um, middle school. Hi, I'm Leslie Landis. I, too, uh, teach Spanish, and I'm moving to the high school level this year. I'm Marcia Davis. I'm in my 15th year. I teach high school Spanish. I've previously taught in immersion as well. I'm John Vincent. This is my 11th year. Um, I teach Spanish and social studies. My name is Josh Scariat. I teach uh, English as a second language. You see that better? You don't have to stand. I can see no, you. No, I thought you looked in like, yeah, exactly. put up. <laughs> so I teach uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Andrea Burns, and I'm a speech and language therapist. And this is my 16th year, and I have middle and high school. Excellent. My name is Jakia Glenn, and I'm a speech and language pathologist. And this is my fifth year in the school. Margarita Rebollero, yo nací en Colombia y he vivido aquí en los Estados Unidos durante 50 años. Tengo cuatro hijos y once nietos. And rounding us, rounding us out, there's me. I'm Carol Robison. I'm from the Center for Latin American Studies, and we coordinated this course. And Erica, you've been working with, Erica is our outreach coordinator. And Siduri, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Siduri Christensen. I'm a PhD candidate in the OSU. <laughs> um, and I, I taught ESL composition and ESL at very level. Excellent. Well, this is so great. You know, I, I guess I didn't quite understand that you were all already teachers. So for me, this is particularly exciting because I, I'm not in the field of education at all, <laughs> as you may or may not know from uh, preparing for this, this class. And um, I'm really a sociologist, and I study family life. Um, I've been very interested in how uh, migration affects families, and particularly children. Um, so it's only actually been in the past year and a half that my research has brought me into school setting. But I've been in school settings in Mexico, uh, which I heard that you learned, you were talking quite a bit about yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 
Um, so I had been in schools in Mexico in my first project, but uh, more recently I've been doing work in schools, not, not really observing the educational aspect, but um, following some kids in schools. So it's been really exciting to me um, to, to learn a little bit about the educational <laughs> settings and to start to think about how my research can actually um, uh, be useful to practitioners and people who are working with children on an everyday basis, which is you guys, I guess. So. Um, and hopefully we can, you know, I have a presentation set up, but I'd like it to be much of a dialogue after I get through and I, I have some questions. Um, I mean, after I'll let you, I'm going to go through the material I presented and then we'll open it up for Q&A and you can ask me any questions you want about my own research. And then I did have some questions for you. So this will be great since you're all practitioners. <laughs> we can talk about it in a much more, you know, in a dialogue um, um, manner. So I, uh, turn on two computers. Um, I think maybe you read something for the, uh, of my prior project for this course today, but I've basically done two um, research studies that have to do with the way migration affects intimate relationships and families. Those are the relationships between um, couples, but also between parents and their children. That's been, really been my primary interest. So the first study uh, looks at family separation and how that um, uh, the quite common pattern of parents migrating to work without their children affects family dynamic. So parents coming to the United States and leaving their children in Mexico. Um, and again, I was always interested in the family dynamic part. I'm interested in how this affects uh, parent-child relationships, what happens while people are apart. But um, while I was in Mexico, I ended up repeatedly visiting quite a few schools. Um, my goal was to figure out how many children <coughs> had a parent in the United States, and so the schools is the biggest captive audience, right? And then it was very easy to gain access to schools in Mexico. Unlike here, when you do research, there's not as much um, bureaucracy to get into the schools, and people were very welcoming, and the teachers wanted me to meet their students and talk about the United States. So I ended up going to 23 schools, actually. Wow. <laughs> so I was in uh, quite a few schools. And you know what I learned is that if one's studying the lives of children, Children end up spending much of their days in a school, so you kind of have to understand the school setting to understand their lives. And to give you one of these um, examples of the unexpected things I learned by doing this is that um, children, I learned, were very uncomfortable about having a migrant parent away. It turns out it's not that uncommon, right? Among the people that I surveyed, the students I surveyed, about one in four um, in different sites had a parent in the United States. That's pretty common, 25%. But the children that I interviewed um, were very uncomfortable about having their parent away. And they're uncomfortable among their peers because in the school setting, what's normalized is the nuclear family is having two parent households. So children felt very uncomfortable. And particularly in schools where teachers would often talk about the kids who have their parents away as coming from broken homes. And you know, there's sort of this, um, uh, treatment of migration in the school curriculum that was very superficial. So this is one of the things I learned. I don't think I would have noticed any of that if I hadn't actually been to the school. Um, so the second study, which is one I'm conducting now, um, is a comparative one, and it focuses on children's lives growing up in different types of Mexican households. Um, and uh, I'm not going to explain the whole sampling <laughs> strategy I have, but I. In short, I have interviewed 80 families, and I've interviewed 40 families in um, Northeast Ohio in the greater Akron area, and 40 families in central New Jersey, which is where I am right now. Um, the, the study is designed to compare key aspects of children's experiences in these two sites, because in Northeast Ohio, the Mexican community is quite invisible. Um, it exists, but it's very invisible um, and spread out in the region. Whereas in the site in New Jersey where I am, it's very concentrated. Um, the school I was most recently at um, a few weeks ago, I, I believe the principal estimates that 80% of the students are of Mexican descent. So it's a very highly concentrated population. So I've been really interested in figuring out what that means for a child's life, right? To grow up in a place where you're one of the only Mexican kids on the block compared to one where there's stores everywhere with Spanish um, signs and products, etc. So uh, based on my work in Mexico, I said, you know, I got to go into the schools this time, right? Because <laughs> I learned so much going into the schools in Mexico. And it, it has been a lot harder to do that here, but I've been successful. So what I ended up doing was picking six children um, in each site. 
and uh, visiting the schools. So I've been in very diverse settings. I've gone into first, second, and third grade classrooms. So I haven't been in the high school or middle schools as some of you teach in, but really focusing on the very elementary school age level. And I've not been there to observe, um, I mean, I can't help but observe teaching, right, because I'm there, but basically what I do is I go in and I hang out, with, I follow the kid all day long. So I start in the morning and if they go to a special, I follow them to the special. If they go to ESL, if they have reading, whatever they do, the best time for, for me is lunch because and recess, because I'm interested in how kids socially interact in school. And so I, you know, I sit with them at recess, um, sorry, at lunchtime, I eat with them and just kind of hang out. Um, so that's been very interesting um, and has really made me as a researcher think about what I can you know, say to, to teachers. <laughs> so this is, like I said, this is exciting to me because it's a good opportunity to do that. So um, what I wanna do today is just share with you my observations about how different types of family dynamics may potentially uh, affect children when they then go to school in the classroom, right? This is really just background information that I think uh, people can be sensitive to as they're working with children in schools, but you, you all will have more ideas about that. Um, the work that I do is in-depth qualitative research, um, what we call ethnography, because I not only interview families, I spend time with them, I, I've done repeated visits with a lot of families, and then I've observed the kids in schools right now. So um, it's very in-depth work, but I always think it's important to frame qualitative work like mine in other research statistics nationwide and also uh, studies that have been done in other states. So today I'm gonna highlight themes that I found in my own research, but other researchers have found as well. And I hope these are thought provoking and can lead to a very good discussion later on. So I think the convention for social scientists when they talk about um, parent-child relationships in immigrant families is to really frame it as a clash between <clears throat> new and old world values, right? The new world values being the values of the US society that immigrant children are raised in, and the old world values, those values of the home country that um, parents bring with them, right? And so, so the idea is that children and parents acculturate at different rates, and this creates a clash um, between parents and children as they're um, adapting and integrating into life in the United States. Well, I think this idea of acculturation is an important one, and I don't mean to disregard it at all, but I do think it's limited in scope because it's really focusing on the individual child or the parent, and it's you know suggesting, like, let's see, <laughs> the, we can understand their lives by focusing on how well they integrate or not integrate. And I think that doesn't allow us to see other things that are happening in immigrant families. So I want to focus my comments today really on the environments children are growing up with, the structure of the home environment. And I think that's what we can use to help better understand um, what they may bring into the classroom setting. So the three areas, kind of the structures of family life that uh, I want to talk about is first the idea of family separation. Clearly, given my research, I feel like this is very important. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about family separation and how I, I um, think that impacts families and then potentially um, follows children into school. Second, I want to talk about children's um, experiences as members of mixed status families. Right now, this um, topic, this catchword, mixed status families, has become quite popular as one to describe um, families in which a child is a US born citizen and their parents may are, are not. So mixed legal status families. But I'd like to broaden the term, and, and the way I want to use it today, although I'll go back and forth a little bit, is thinking of social status, right? Because if a child's born here, it has a different social status. He or she has a different social status than his or her parent, whether or not that parents become legalized, the U.S. born or a, a naturalized citizen or not. Regardless of the legal issue, they're ha they have a different position in their families. So we'll talk about that. And then finally, I want to talk about how issues of mobility affect um, children and immigrant families. And uh, again, because my research is mostly with Mexican families, that's what I'm going to be <laughs> focusing on mostly. Hopefully, some of you have some experience with um, children from other groups, and, and we can talk more about how this may apply to other groups later. 
Um, so, hey, let me just stop here and ask you, how many of you are working in districts with a lot of immigrant students? Because I don't really know Columbus. <laughs> Go ahead. All of Columbus. Well, all, all of you? Of, well, we're all teachers with, for the Columbus City School District, and our district has um, a lot of immigrant students, specifically from Somalia, um, but um, we do have Latino students and whatnot. I wasn't really sure because, uh, like I said, in the schools in, in New Jersey that I've been visiting, there's a very high percentage of Latino students. The one school, like 80%, but in other schools, there's still, you know, 40, 50% Latino students. Um, in, in Akron, <laughs> The schools I visited um, had uh, the kids that I visited were, was following were one or two in the classroom, and in the entire school, maybe a family from grade. Sometimes they're all cousins, so it was a very different school environment. So um, I thought when I was, you know, in Akron, I was thinking if I were a teacher, man, it would be so, so easy to forget that today one in four children are children of immigrants, are growing up in an immigrant household. One in four. That's a lot. <laughs> and I think what happens in the school environments like the ones I was in in the Akron area is that a lot of children, if they're not labeled ELL, they're not getting ESL help, or they're, you know, uh, have one parent who's an English speaker and one who's not, they're kind of under the radar. You know, people don't know that they're immigrant ch they're children of immigrant households. So I think it depends on what kind of district you're in. That's why I was asking how many, I don't really know what the schools you guys work in are like, but sometimes it's hard to know. And there are a lot more children than we may expect. So one in four, that's the, that's the key number. One in four now are living, our children growing up in an immigrant household where one or both parents are immigrants. Now, of course, most of these children are US born citizens, but 20% are immigrants themselves. I'm gonna talk first about immigrant children. Um, more than 1.7 million children are expected to be, or estimated to be undocumented themselves and at risk of deportation. However, research really suggests that this undocumented status for students only becomes important when they reach um, a young adulthood. So as a child reaches high school, starts thinking about applying for college, about what's gonna happen next, then that illegal status, that undocumented status becomes a huge problem. In other words, researchers suggest that in schools, children who are undocumented are somewhat productive. They live in a protected uh, environment, or they function in a protective environment because schools are not allowed to ask about legal status, right? It's something that uh, gets the rules. And, <laughs> um, so I think that for young children, when we're in educational, thinking about their educational settings as being somewhat protective, the legal, the actual legal status may not be as important as thinking about how a child came to the United States. How did their, how, what's the story of migration, right? How did their family come? And uh, most of the child, most immigrants come um, often due to legal complications, of course, in step migration patterns. Those are patterns, step migration patterns in which you know, a parent comes first and then it's followed by another parent and then followed by children or maybe if one parent comes and then they're not all migrating together, typically. I think this is a logical migration strategy. It's not surprising at all. But if we really do think about a child's life, even one year of separation can have a really large impact. Um, now, we don't have national data, nationally representative, representative data, about how many children are experiencing separation. It, it doesn't exist, but there is I mean, it's very suggestive. Um, some researchers went and, and did a longitudinal study of immigrant kids in Boston and San Francisco across different ethnic groups. And they found that a whole 85% had experienced a separation from one of both of their parents prior to migration, 85%. So when you're talking about that group of immigrant children, separation is, is part of and parcel of how they came to the United States. Um, there are, of course, pre-migratory separations that occur with those step migration patterns and post migration separations, um, which may result due to a deportation. So I want to talk about both of those um, today. 
Um, it's also important to remember that family separation disproportionately affects immigrants of certain, from certain countries. So in that same study that was done in Boston and San Francisco, they found the highest rates of separation among Central Americans and Haitians, 96% of children from each of those groups had experienced a separation, and the lowest rates were among Chinese families. However, 65% of Chinese immigrant children in the sample had experienced a separation, still over half, so it's still pretty common. Um, I believe in Mexican children were right at the middle, around 85% experienced a separation. Uh, what I've spent a lot of time thinking about in my research is how separation is a highly gendered process, okay? Again, I'm sorry I can't put up like half of this at a time, so <laughs> bear with me. I'd rather put this up a little at a time so we can talk at it about it slowly. But um, in terms of the pre-migration first, um, children experience separation much more commonly from their fathers than they do from their mothers. This is a historical pattern in the United States in which men migrate first without their children. Now, there are some countries where this is not as common it, and where female migration patterns have been more common historically, particularly the West Indies. But in the case of Mexico, which I know best, um, it's for years since the Bracero program in the 1950s, Mexican men have come to work in the United States on a temporary seasonal pattern in which the men come and they um, work for maybe seven, eight months out of the year and return to Mexico to be with their children for a few months out of the year. Very common pattern. So this idea of men leaving their children behind is pretty um, normalized in Mexico. But things have changed, and I'm not going to go into all the uh, history of migration, why it's changing in the Mexican case. But um, suffice to say that, that this circular migratory pattern has, has very much changed in the past 20 years. Uh, Mexicans are settling more in the United States than they had in the past. And so that means that children are now experiencing separations from mothers much more often than they used to. Now, it could be two types of uh, patterns. It can be that the mother uh, joins the husband in the U.S. and can't bring the children with them right off. So then the child's experiencing a separation from both parents for a time, remaining with a caregiver in Mexico. In my research, I found that most of the time, children stay with grandparents and maternal grandparents. Um, but it also could be that children um, are the children of single mothers in Mexico. And for a single mother in Mexico, it's quite hard, and, and particularly in some rural areas, it's very difficult to find employment and um, employment that's enough to provide for the family. So single mothers are, are now using their networks to come to the United States to work here and then leaving their children behind. These different pathways are really important, right? Because uh, a child separated from a single migrant mother has experienced greater poverty than a child who's just been separated from his or her father, who's just been away temporarily. They're, they're different pathways. I think they're very important to children. Uh, moving over to the post-migration um, issues of separation. I don't know how much you guys have know about this uh, or see it in the news, but we are now in an era, a historical era, where there's been more deportations of undocumented immigrants than ever before historically. Um, what's interesting is that they're actually, <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security does not uh, release any data about the gender of who they're deporting. So I can't really confirm what I'm about to tell you now with national level data. But what I can tell you is from case studies, it appears to me, particularly among Mexicans, that fathers are much more often detained than mothers. This is often because fathers are working outside the home at higher rates than women are. They're on the roads more. They may be at workplaces where they can be picked up. But particularly with traffic stops, I think that that's, helps explain it. So fathers are much more often detained than mothers. And then in, in my interviews, I found out actually in Ohio anyway, these practices are very localized and they vary. So I don't, you know, I don't know in Columbus exactly. Or, or there are some differences between New Jersey and Northeast Ohio. But in Northeast Ohio, when both parents are detained. Uh, what they're typically doing is releasing the mother to be with the children and then deporting the father and then the mother has a court date set six, eight months in advance. Okay, so I don't want to say that's a bad thing because I personally think we should be releasing mothers. I mean, it's a good thing, right? We don't want the kids to have nobody to be with. 
But what happens in a family, right, is then the father's deported without getting to see his children, and women are sudden single mothers. Uh, there is a huge economic impact of, of suddenly having no income of your husband, of um, suddenly being in charge of all the child care, all the transportation, all that has to do with single motherhood without having any preparation for it, right? When there's a marital problem uh, in a family, you know, you have some preparation knowing that this is going to happen. When, when a parent's supported, when a father's supported, um, they don't. So um, some of the families that I've interviewed when a father's deported, um, the separation is temporary because the mother can't handle it on her own and saves money or puts money or finds money in some way to help her husband come back in an undocumented status, which is, of course, uh, very risky as well for the stability of the family over the long run um, and incurs a huge financial cost. Um, but it's also true that a number of the families I've interviewed, um, when a father's deported, there's been a permanent separation of the family. I mean, it just falls apart. Men from, when they're in Mexico, cannot send money to support the family here because they can't earn enough. So there's like a permanent separation. And I've interviewed a number of single mothers who've become single mothers because their husbands were deported and they weren't able to work it out as a family. So uh, I think these are very important. How do they affect children? Well, in terms of the pre-migration uh, pre types of separation, um, quite a bit of research, including my own work, suggests that children often feel very resentful when they're left behind by their parents. They typically feel more resentful of mothers who they expect to be the family caregiver than they do of their fathers who they expect to be providers, economic providers. So as long as their fathers are sending money back, they may feel less resentful of their father for being away than they do of their mother. Um, but they may be resentful of both parents. So I put up a quote here on a PowerPoint um, from one of the grandmothers I interviewed who uh, was taking care of her son um, in Mexico, or her grandson, excuse me, in Mexico. She said, you know, he doesn't really love his parents. I noticed this when they first came back to visit. He was like eight years old. When they came, he didn't want to have anything to do with them. Since then, he doesn't want to talk to them on the phone. I found in my work that uh, often the resentment that children have um, leads children to resist uh, reunification with their parents. So sometimes the periods of separation grow longer than parents expected or than children expected because there's a tension that occurs because of it after the parent leaves. Um, <clears throat> but what's also interesting is that family separation is viewed by all members of the family uh, as a sacrifice. This idea of the parents leave in order to provide for their children. It's a sacrifice. So children really feel the most resentful, not necessarily when their parents leave, but when the parents don't live up to expectations of that sacrifice. So what are the expectations, right? First, that their life will be better now that their parents leave. You know, parents say, I'm going to leave so I can build a house or um, send money for you to go to school. So children expect their lives to improve financially. They expect that the separation will be short-lived because most parents leave thinking that they will be apart from their children for a year or two years at the most. And they also expect that parents will continue to call them, will be in touch, will somehow show how much they love them from a distance. So these are the types of expectations that hold families together while they're apart. And when those expectations go unmet, children become extremely resentful. They don't really even feel bad for being left behind. They feel bad because they feel like the deal that they've agreed with their parents is not being met. Um, so uh, I also put up a quote to try to exemplify this from a, a boy, a 14-year-old I interviewed in Mexico. Um, his mother lived in the United States, and um, he was complaining about her contact with him. She, he said, um, because if she loved us, she would call, not even that she doesn't send money, because that doesn't matter, but at least she has to call. She has to call to say that she's okay, how important that constant contact is a child. Um, of course, I found that this is affected by gender as well, and that uh, children expect their mothers to do things like call, whereas their fathers they expect them to send money. So the uh, expectations of migration are different for mothers and fathers. 
Uh, other types of uh, sources of tension in families while they're living apart are related to changes that occur in families after the parent leaves. Um, for one, a number of parents uh, have um, new marriages or remarry once they're in the United States, or sometimes it's just that there are rumors of infidelity, particularly of fathers. Um, and the single mothers who migrate um, often remarry, almost all of them did. I think I only interviewed actually one mother who did not remarry after migration um, in my sample. It's not representative, um, but it's not as common, right? Many women remarry. Um, they come to the U.S. for a, new, a fresh start. So then the children in Mexico have a new stepfather, in this case, who they don't know and they never met, right? Um, this is something that uh, a source of tension that all members of families describe to me, parents, grandparents, and children. Um, in fact, the, the, what I put up is an example of how a mother uh, was explaining that her case was different. She wasn't like the rest. Defended the new husband she had found in the United States as he said that he accepted, she said that he accepted his name on his own. They even called him Papa. She's straight and she's different. Um, the other that thing that happens post-migration is that new children are born. <laughs> that can happen whether or not it's a single mother who's migrated and remarried and has a new child, or whether or not a mother is migrating with her husband um, and they have another child in the United States. And uh, tensions with, with uh, US-born siblings um, are very common. I think that these tensions occur because, in effect, uh, children born in the U.S. compete over parents' limited resources. These are subtle tensions. You know, some kids are really obvious, and they tell me quite point blank, I'm jealous of my sister or you know, brother in the U.S., but others won't say it. Like, they'll say they love them, but you can hear how it comes out every now and then. So uh, the jealousy over U.S. born siblings is a problem. Um, I particularly noticed this with men, right? Because a lot of the men who had migrated didn't spend a lot of time with their children who were born in Mexico. They were away, but their children were young. Um, and then the U.S. born children um, get a lot more attention from their fathers. A lot of families um, share job shifts, or they, they coordinate their job shifts so men are doing a lot of caregiving with their children. And they didn't do that with the kids in Mexico. So kids may feel resentful for the attention they, you know, that their fathers are giving. Um, siblings that they themselves did not get. But I think that um, the other point I want to make is that the birth of a U.S. born child really undermines that expectation that it's a sacrifice. So um, one of the boys I interviewed complained, uh, for example, that his father had another child in the U.S. And, and the way he put it was this, this is an older child, again, very articulate. He said, I don't understand. It is so ignorant. If you cannot make it with us, how can he do it with another one, right? It's really undermining that idea that the parent had migrated to help him. Okay, <laughs> separation due to deportations. Um, I know I told you I'm like jumping around with themes, but we can, we can talk, hopefully they're just thought provoking. Uh, first, there are a number of financial and emotional effects of a deportation. Um, I described some of the financial difficulties. It was a short-term se uh, separation because um, the parent comes back to the U.S. and the undocumented status. There's still a huge financial um, cost. And if, uh, if it's a permanent separation, then a child is now living with a, in a single-parent household. You know, what's really interesting, too, is that Mexican immigrant families, focusing on them, have the highest rates of children living in dual parent households nationwide of any ethnic group. So it's a particular shock for a, a mother to then become a single mother for, you know, if she's living in a Mexican family where they're used to having um, the support of both parents. Um, there's a lot of sociological data, and you guys have probably heard this also, about how children in single parent households not do as well economically the economic resources than children in dual parent. So I think that financial effect is a problem. So let's talk a little bit about the children. Um, I do interview kids, so I can tell you a little bit about their perspectives. Um, 
Uh, one is that short-term emotional distress that occurs right around an incident. So uh, a 12-year-old I interviewed in Ohio um, had both of her parents picked up um, uh, one day. Uh, they went out to a Walmart to buy diapers for actually a niece. They gave somebody a ride. It wasn't even for her own siblings who are younger than her. She's one of four. Um, and uh, I think the father turned right at a stop sign of a parking lot at Walmart, and the police officer picked him up and arrested him and arrested his wife, who was a passenger in the vehicle, and arrested uh, two other members, people who were in the vehicle and sent them into deportation proceedings, all four of them. Um, she said she was at home with another uncle while her parents were out. She said, my uncle came in my room, and he woke me up, and he said, your mom is the police daughter. I don't know, like my head almost exploded. It looked like it exploded. That's like my mom. I think if you can imagine your head exploding, <laughs> kind of news for a while, right? Um, so these short-term emotional consequences of an incident um, are important to remember. Although I will say um, that a lot of the parents that I have interviewed, if they can help it, try to shield their children from knowing the younger children family from knowing about an incident. They're trying to shield them from this short-term emotional distress. And then, of course, there are the more long-term consequences when there is a more permanent separation um, about how a child's life might change after such an incident. So one 14-year-old who I interviewed in New Jersey um, was 11 when her father was supported. She explained, my mom started working when I was in the fifth grade. So I've been pretty much taking care of my brother since like fifth grade. It was a lot harder for me because I never really experienced my mom going to work before. Her life completely changed. She actually became the primary caregiver for younger brother after the deportation. All right, I've gone on and on about family separation. What does this have to do with school? Well, I think you can imagine that the emotional distress I'm describing around deportations would be brought into the classroom, right? Um, my mother, she's now retired, but she was a teacher for 30 years, and she always told me, I mean, maybe you guys have the same experience, she always told me with her kids, she always knew when one of them was parents were getting divorced or having some problems, because they always brought it in with them in the classroom. She, she could usually tell when something was going on at home. So I think you can imagine, this is similar, right? When something's going on at home, kids, have, kids bring this stuff with them into the classroom. Um, the emotional distress. But I have to tell you, there's not been any research done yet to prove, you know, some sort of causal relationship between deportation and kids' grades or anything like that. So it's something that I hope researchers pick up on in the future. It's not, it's yet to be done to show a correlation. Um, but you know what? I, I expect that there is one, uh, mostly because there has been a lot of data that's come out recently about how these other types of families separation do affect kids in school. So children who have migrant parents in the U.S. and Mexico have lower grades. They perform more poorly in school than their peers. And many different indicators like their grades, their dropout rates are higher. There's a lot of suggestion that kids in Mexican schools do worse if their parents are from away. Right? To me, this suggests that it's not money, right? Because if the parents migrating usually the parents sending money back to Mexico. So it's not like a financial problem. The kids are, are typically receiving money from their parents. So something emotionally disturbing is disturbing, disturbing to them, that resentment, those feelings of distress at having a parent away um, is affecting their schooling. Then uh, when children join their parents in the United States, there's also a bit of data to show that these negative outcomes in school continue. Two possible explanations. First, it could be that while children were experiencing that separation while they're still in their home country, their parents are here, they kind of fall behind educationally, right? So they're like already behind, and then they come to the U.S. and it's like a catch-up game already. So they're bringing that that educational disadvantage with them from a separation. So that's one possibility. Um, the other possibility is simply that the stresses of reunification are really difficult. Okay. Um, again, there's more research that suggests that reunification creates a lot of tension in families because expectations continue to go unmet. You know, in all the families I interviewed, I focused on families during that period they were apart. I met families after they, you know, I still had some contact with them when they got together, but I was focusing on that, that experience of being apart. 
So what I learned from them is everybody thought their problems were living apart. And if they got together again, everything would magically disappear, you know? This longing to be together. And then once they're together again, like Hollywood, everything will be better. It's not the case. <laughs> Children have to leave caregivers to become of use accustomed to in their home countries when they come to the U.S., so they leave some important um, adult bonds behind. Then they come to the U.S., they meet new step-parents, new siblings, uh, their parents have changed post-migration, life is different, everything's different. So tensions continue, and I, I think those ongoing tensions of reunification, um, they can last years, you know, and, and that can also be a reason that children who've experienced the separation do more poorly at school than children who immigrate with their parents. Um, do you guys want to stop? I'm about to switch gears. Do you want to stop and ask any questions? Do you want to save them all to the end? So I'm going to move from family separation. I mean, I don't know if anybody has any questions you want to talk about now. Yeah. How long does it take um, the reunification process to occur generally? I mean, we talked with someone yesterday who talked about all these emotions you were just describing, but overcame them, reunited with her family, and everything was great. Do some of those, sometimes do those hostilities, can the kids not get past that ever? Oh yeah, definitely. Or, you know, I don't really have, um, <laughs> I, like I said, I focus on families while they're apart in my research, so I, I feel like it's, I, if what I'm telling you is based on my experience okay. with families and not on my studies findings per se yet, but in my experience, uh, families that experience separation while a child was young are usually able to overcome it. You know, the child was separated for a year or two when he was five or six. That is, you know, families are able to come together and then uh, overcome those difficulties. There's always tension six months after reunification. But I've met many families that if they were separated during the teenage years, <laughs> so I'll give you an example. Currently, one of the families that I've, I've been working with here in New Jersey, um, I'm focusing on a, a third-year-old boy who's actually born here, the third grade boy, I'm sorry. Third grade boy was born here, so I know the family through him. But he has two siblings who were born in Mexico, and they were separated um, for, I think, uh, three or four years. Um, now, the younger of the two is currently 14 and in high school and doing fairly well because she was she joined her parents in the US by the time she was like 10 uh, 10 or 11 so she you know she talked about it being uncomfortable for a while but she sort of seems to be on a pathway that's that's working I mean who knows what will happen in a few years but right now she's in high school and doing well getting good grades and the younger boy gets very good grades as well a very good student the older son came and had huge problems the father described him even having suicidal thoughts they had to get counseling for him and um, currently he dropped out of high school because he got his girlfriend pregnant and they're now living together he's a father and working full-time I think he's 17 wow. so you can see that different pathway by the age so I would suspect that there's you know there's a very different pathway depending on the age of separation how long and you know of course individual psychology as well child but right thank you yeah. but I think you can you know those of you who are working in high schools you you might see that this kind of ongoing thing even if the separation happened three or four years ago I think there's an ongoing effect particularly in the um, adolescent years and you know my research uh, I did find very systematically in Mexico the kids who are adolescents were very very resentful of their parents for leaving them. It goes with adolescents, right? right. <laughs> that anger and the blame of parents. But it coincides, you know, in the, in the child's life course, if the separation coincides in that period, it's more difficult to get over. Are there any other questions on the family separation piece? So you guys already talked, talked a lot about this yesterday. <laughs> Is that right? Some of mm -hmm. this, yeah. It's all. Okay. It's all there. Uh, sorry if I'm being repetitive. No, um, so I'll That's now great. switch gears though. <laughs> we talked some about the kids who are born in Mexico and coming here. Now um, I want to switch gears and um, talk about U.S. born children. What we like to call the children of immigrants, not immigrant children, the children of immigrants. Um, 
So overall, you know, these children, of course, are not necessarily experiencing family separations unless there's a deportation um, because they're born here. And, but uh, overall, we have a lot of data to suggest that children who live in immigrant households or children of immigrants are disadvantaged in many ways. They're twice as likely to have poor, ha poor health than children of non-immigrants. They most often, more often lack health insurance. Many live in overcrowded housing. They're much more likely to live in poverty. 54% of children in immigrant households live in low-income families compared to 36% of children of non-immigrants. So it's a huge difference, right? They're also more likely to live in dual parent households than um, non-immigrant, uh, children in non-immigrant households. So they're, they have dual family earners, or dual wage earners in the family. So it's not like single parenthood that explains this difference. So uh, children in immigrant households have a lot of disadvantages. But I think we have to remember um, that children who are US born citizens have a different set of resources and opportunities available to them than their parents. A lot of the data you'll see out there kind of lumps kids of children in immigrant households as kind of all being the same. And what I'm trying to suggest to you is that there are power differences within a family between children and their parents because of their legal and social status. Um, overall, four fifths of children of U.S. of immigrants are U.S. citizens, um, and 61% live in these mixed status families. I was saying that a lot of the uh, scholars use that in terms of legal status, right? But I'd like us to think more of social status because I think being a U.S. born citizen has a different social status um, with it than being a natural, even a naturalized citizen or um, a legal permanent resident or an undocumented. Of course, uh, having a mixed, living in a mixed status family is much more common for children in the elementary school ages because 93% of children under the age of six are U.S. born citizens. Um, they're just the demographic, it's just represented the demographic. If you're older, if it's an older child, you're much more likely to have been an immigrant yourself and born somewhere else, right? So I think those of you who are working at the elementary school levels are much more likely to have children in mixed status households than those in the middle and, um, and high schools where are, you're more likely to be working with children who are immigrants themselves. Um, so there's this social status difference between US born children and their parents lead to some very interesting tensions and dynamics in families. I think one of the most interesting and what I wanted to focus on today is um, the uh, issue of language ability and fluency. So estimates suggest that um, in the year 2000, I guess a little old data now, 58% uh, of all children of immigrants had at least one parent who was limited in English. These language barriers are extremely important aspects of parent-child relationships in immigrant families. In fact, many case studies have found that children have much better English skills than their parents and end up being family translators. This may sound familiar to you with some of the children you work with. Um, this uh, may be true for even young children in elementary school ages, but it's usually the oldest child in the family that's often in the position of being the family translator. Um, so the work of Marjorie Oriana is one scientist among others, really points out the numerous ways children's roles as family translators should really be considered work. They're really doing work in their families that children in non-immigrant households are not doing. Because uh, the work they do in medical settings, in educational settings, and in commercial settings is things that we pay other people to do. We pay adults to do this kind of work, right? So children are actually doing work in their homes um, that other kids won't do. They help each other with homework, they translate for members of the community um, at school events, they may interpret letters or school correspondence, they report school absences, they call in, um, and they help their parents assess preschool settings. I mean, there's a whole slew of things, of types of work that um, children are doing in their families. In my own work, I actually ask children how they feel about this, um, I interview kids. So um, kids don't like to do it. <laughs> you know, I've read all this work before, and I, I, I didn't know what. You know, I honestly didn't know. You know, some 
kids like to be in the position of power and others they don't. So most of the kids I interviewed actually say they don't like to. I put up a quote, just an example, 10 year old, do you ever have to translate hey, for your mom? Yes. Do you have? Do you like doing it? Not really. How come? Because sometimes I don't know how to say some things in English, in Spanish, it's so hard. So um, I think there's just this discomfort at being in this position of, of power, actually. Um, it's interesting, you know. Um, the other thing I've, I've learned is that um, parents also use trans children as translators differently depending on where they live. Like my research is now in Northeast Ohio and New Jersey. Northeast Ohio, there's very few bilingual people employed at local social service areas. So children work as translators in their families much, much more often than in New Jersey. So I, I put up a quote, hopefully it exemplifies it. This is one of the mothers I interviewed in New Jersey. She says, uh, yeah, my daughter translates for me sometime. Her English isn't that good. But she's basically able to work it out over the phone because she says they call and I tell them to wait or get somebody. She's able to ask them to find somebody to help her on the phone who speaks Spanish. And she knows enough to make an appointment. The people on the other end of the line are, are used to having Spanish speakers call in enough. So there's an infrastructure that supports um, Spanish speakers much more in central New Jersey. I think what's most telling about this is that parents uh, don't like to use their kids as translators either because if something's available not to use them, they won't use their kids as translators and children don't like to do it either. So it's kind of interesting, right? Um, other researchers have, have thought that, you know, we should take this idea of translation and expand it a little bit, right? Because children aren't only translators, they're really cultural brokers when they're doing all this kind of labor in the home. Um, one researcher describes, kind of groups these into three kinds of work. Uh, one is tutors, one is advocates, and one is surrogate parents. Um, in terms of tutors, they're, they're not only translating and maybe teaching their parents uh, words in English, but they're also teaching their parents about aspects of US society. So it goes beyond the language, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And in terms of advocates, they're not only interpreting uh, if um, an institution comes in contact with their family, but they also may defend parents um, in the face of those institutions or intervene on the behalf of parents. And then they're also doing a lot of caretaking um, activities. Um, sometimes parents consult them to about buying things. So this goes beyond language, right? That language is the entrance, but it, it, it grows up. It's a bigger deal. Um, so some of these, you know, what I think is interesting about this idea is that if children are cultural brokers, then it, it upsets the balance of power within a family, right? Because not only, um, you know, children are now posited as kind of experts in the family and they gain authority and parents lose authority. So how do they feel about it? I think they may resent it. Obviously they don't like to translate, so perhaps there's some resentment involved, but they also may enjoy that increase of power and kind of use it to their advantage. There's a power, um, change in power dynamics in families. Um, one of the families I interviewed in New Jersey like totally exemplified this, that's why I had to put these up. Uh, so I interviewed the mother um, first, and she talked about how she's having trouble with her 14-year-old daughter right now who's kind of entering the rebellious stage and that they're conflict, they have a lot of conflicts right now, they've been fighting a lot. Actually, she said it's getting better, but last year was really bad. And, and she said that she thinks that, you know, this is actually the girl I said started to watch her brother once her father was deported. Um, so she's been helping her mom take care of her younger brother for three years. And her mom said, you know, I think that because she is now so important to me, she like uses that to her advantage. When we fight, she tries to get out of her. She says, but I help you and I do this and this and this and I want to go out with my friends. So she uses it as kind of a, a point in their fights. But when I interviewed her, she tells me this. She said, um, she said that she didn't really, uh, I actually, I think that end of the interview I asked her, I asked some of the children, I said, if you could tell President Obama something about what it's like to be a kid growing up in your neighborhood, what would you tell him? And she said, you know, I think that us Hispanic kids, she said, Hispanic kids, we, we grow up too quickly. And I said, hmm, what do you mean? She said, well, you know, when I was younger, I would have to like translate. So I would know like more than I was supposed to when I was younger. 
And she said, she went on to say as we were conversing, I don't know, usually kids my age won't be like, they won't have as much responsibility as I do now. She was talking about it as a very negative thing. So she does use it in the fights with her mother. I mean, that's what her mother was complaining about, but she didn't like it. <laughs> she didn't want to be in this position of authority. So I, I think that's a very interesting thing that, you know, children have this authority, but they don't necessarily like it. You know, interestingly to me, it's, it's, it's very similar to the work, to what I did in Mexico. I found that kids, that their parents the way also described feeling more independent and not really liking it. They felt like they didn't have a parent now to watch what they were doing, those adolescents, and then they, you know, it wasn't like they liked having that increased freedom. They, they didn't feel good about it. Okay, so how does this idea of children um, work, doing work as translators and cultural brokers in their families, what happens in school environments? Uh, well, like I said, I'm not an educator, but I've been in a number of schools now. And so I've heard both in Mexico and the United States how important parental involvement is for student success, or that's what a lot of people talk about. I don't know how you all feel about that, but I've heard this a lot. <laughs> you know, let's get parents involved. When parents are involved, their kids do better in school. So I think it's difficult to uh, encourage parental involvement when there are these language barriers and when children are the intermediate uh, the intermediary between home and school. How do you get parents involved when their children are the person that's kind of the link? Um, I put up here a quote, uh, just an example from my current research um, of a mother in Ohio. I told you that in Northeast Ohio, a lot of the kids I interviewed were in schools and neighborhoods where there weren't any, any other Latino youth. So one of the mothers I interviewed um, is a mother of four, uh, two twins at age six and a 14 and 13 year old. Um, I asked them about their daily routines, and she explained to me that each of her children does their homework on their own, and that they end up trying to help each other out with it. She told me her oldest daughter often complains about having to help the younger ones with homework. She says, it is that I don't know very much. She is the one who teaches them. My oldest daughter says, who is there to help me? And I say, well, daughter, it's that I don't know it. How can I do it if I don't understand? can see kind of that tension. Now I later was able to go in to the school um, with the six-year-olds who were twins, both in first grade, both they didn't get ESL support because it was a school that didn't have any ESL support because there weren't enough immigrant children, but they were receiving assistance from a reading specialist. And uh, um, you know, I told you I followed the kids around, so when she came to pick up the kids, we walked down the hall, she kind of chatted with me as we're walking down, and she said, do you know whether or not mom works with them at home really quick? And I said, before I could even answer, she went on to say, she was sure that mom didn't. She was right, right? And she said, I don't know how the kids are going to learn how to read because she doesn't have any support at home. So you can see this disjuncture, right? Her, the teacher, the reading specialist, get me involved in order to help the kids start reading, and mom feeling helpless at being able to, and the oldest uh, sibling not wanting to be in the position of having to do it. Problem, right? Problem with parental involvement. Um, so parents struggle to monitor children's schooling when they when children are in this position of translators and cultural brokers. Um, I think that parental involvement is also difficult because a lot of um, parents are very insecure. Immigrant parents are very insecure about institutional settings in the United States. Maybe you've come across this with some of the families in your schools, but I've done interviews uh, now in two states and I've read lots of studies about um, about immigration and one of the very common themes that comes up in all sorts of interviews is that immigrant parents are fearful that they can't discipline their kids in the United States, that if they spank their children, that CPS, the Child Protective Services, will come in and take their kids away. You know, I don't know how many times I've had to say, you know, I mean, I don't want to... <laughs> Or corporal punishment or anything like that, but I, you know, I do say after after a while, I'm comfortable saying, you know, that's not exactly how it works here because it's not right. You know, parents are allowed to spank their child <laughs> without CPS taking their kids away, but but immigrant parents don't think that, and so they think if they if they're strict and if they are strict with their kids, that they're going to have problems with an institution. They're afraid of this, and kids actually do threaten to call 
child protective services on their parents. Kids go to school, they get lots of training, which I think is good training. Believe me, I, I, I feel very much like a child advocate with all the work I've done. You know, I don't want to see a kid in any, oh, so many, so awful some of the things you see, right? But kids go to school so they get training about their rights. It's a good thing, right? But then kids come home and with that authority, that imbalance in authority in the family that I was telling you about, kids often uh, will threaten in a fight to call Child Protective Services on their parents. I've heard it. I have examples of it. I didn't put one out, but I, I've heard it in my days. Yeah, I've read it in other data. So this is a problem, right? And I think it's a real problem in schools that are trying to get parents involved when parents need to feel that schools are a safe environment. <laughs> But they worry about their children going to school and coming home and saying, I'm going to call CPS if you punish me or something like that. I will say that children are also complicit at times with their parents and avoiding the intervention of the state. So it's not always a one way where, you know, it's not always that the kids are like fighting with their parents and throwing it in there. I mean, it, it works both ways. So I can give you an example of this that I wrote down. Uh, one of the mothers I interviewed in Ohio told me that once a neighbor called the police to report that she left her three kids who were 11, 10, and 5 home alone. She had gone to run an errand and left them home for, I think, a half hour or something like this. She said when the police officer came, her oldest son claimed that she was in the bathroom <laughs> trying to help her out. Mm -hmm. And then the police, then of course she walked in the door and the police officer was really mad because, you know, she, she'd come in afterwards. So, Children can be complicit parents, and they work in both ways, right? They don't necessarily want their parents to get in trouble. Um, I think the bottom line is, and I, I think I would really like to talk more about this because it's something I've been thinking about. You, you guys clearly have a lot of um, experience with this, but um, if schools want to have parents to be involved, school must be seen as a safe environment for immigrant parents, and the trick is how do you make that happen? Now, I've been in New Jersey um, with this high concentration of immigrants in the school district, and these schools that I've visited work really hard to make their schools a receptive place for immigrant parents. The school I was in, for example, most of the kids speak English, right? There are some, uh, there are bilingual programs, but most of the kids are speaking English, but they have all the signs up in Spanish and English, everything, everywhere. Um, gosh, even. <laughs> Even in the staff lounge, signs were in Spanish and English and they crack me up in the bathroom, you know, or, or in the staff bathroom. They, you know, they just make this school environment and it works. Of the parents that I interviewed, the parents in New Jersey described much more confidence and comfort in going into their school and higher levels of involvement in their children's school. And they, they told me that they would go to school if they had a problem with their kids. Not all of them, there's always some differences, but on the most part on the whole. So I think it works. Um, the, the parents I interviewed in Ohio, gosh, it took a very, you know, one of those parents with a lot of guts is really uh, advocate for their kid to go into school with all the language barriers, being the only Mexican family in that school. Do you guys want to stop here and ask any questions before I move on to the theme of mobility? Um, I have one quick question. You were just saying that the parents in New Jersey felt more comfortable going in. Do you know anything about, and yesterday we talked about education levels of parents and how the more educated parents would be more willing to go to school. Do you know yeah. anything about the education level of the parents in New Jersey versus the ones in Northern Ohio? Yeah, I do. I mean, actually, there is, my samples aren't different. I, I think that's definitely true across the board. You know, parents who are more educated are more comfortable. But um, I... In my sample, the, the difference, the variation between the samples are the same in both sites. I have very uneducated parents in New Jersey and highly educated parents in both sites. And, you know, that class difference really matters, but I don't think it can't be overcome is what I'm saying. Um, I think in, a, in an environment, you know, in New Jersey, their parents are very involved um, despite the education level. Thank you. I don't know how you make it happen. I'm not a, you know what I mean? There is actually a school in New Jersey I've been visiting where it's not the case. Um, they, uh, it's a suburban school, so I think it's got something like 40% Indian immigrants, 40% Latino, and then 20% white and African American. And they've, they've had a lot of trouble getting the Latino parents to participate. A lot of the Indian parents are participating and in the school all the time. And, and the Latino parents aren't. And they feel like it's that issue of the educational background, which I would agree to some extent, but 
And then in the other the other school I was in, they've somehow been able to get beyond that barrier and create a place where even parents with very low levels of education are going into the school. So hard to say. Yeah. I think some of this too deals with, you know, there may be a willingness within the faculty of the school to involve these parents, but some of our schools have active PTOs, PTAs, and whatnot. And within the society around the school, they may not want us to welcome, I don't want to say they may not want us to welcome, but they create an environment where it's not welcoming for this particular group of students to come to this school. And how yeah. do we embrace the community around our schools to change their attitudes towards these groups of children, per se. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, actually, I, I totally see what you're saying. You know, I would say that the school, is, it makes a lot of sense, because the school I'm describing, where there's a lot of parental involvement, despite education levels, has a, a PTO that's, um, that's kind of like a Spanish speaker PTO. They have a, an organization. In fact, I know the mother, I interviewed her family, who, uh, who's the president for her side, and she's got like a sixth grade level education or something in her town, but she's one of those go-getters, like, I don't know, it wouldn't matter. Right. And, uh, and the school that I'm describing where the, the Indian families are very involved and the others aren't, you know, one of the mothers I interviewed at that school, one of the Mexican mothers said that the PTO is all the white parents. And I was like, really? You know, that's interesting because there's not very many white kids in the school. I haven't seen too many. And she said, yeah. Well, that's you know part of the reason why we don't feel comfortable going in and I, you know so i do think that that pto link is an important one to kind of facilitate and yeah. because you know also going into what you were saying you know i was just looking back over the school year and i've had more experiences this school year dealing with um i teach spanish but dealing with latino students that aren't in my classes but are in the school itself and you know, whenever their parents come or what it come or I'm the only resource they have. Yeah. And you know, it puts me on the spot because I'm not I mean, yes, I teach Spanish, I know Spanish, but there's a lot of technical terms that I never needed to know. Of and course. you know, I can't provide them with the best. Like I had one example, I kind of feel, you know, sometimes the schools can be a damned if you do, damned if, damned if you don't type situation, this mother got a letter from the court about her son's attendance for truancy. Mm -hmm. She didn't understand it at all. She came to the school, and I'm, I'm trying to explain this to her. I said, you have to go to the court. This isn't, I mean, this is bigger than the school right now. And I, you know, I tried to explain to her, her son had 40 some absences. When he's gone, please write a note. It can be in English, Spanish, write a note that says, He's absent, and, and why? And he had just had one, so I gave her paper. I said, well, let's do this now. She couldn't write anything down. So I mean, she doesn't know the system. I had no, I don't know how, I'm not equipped to help this woman. Right. And she's just in this legal circle that, eh, I don't know, it's just frustrating. Yeah, and I bet you in that family, I mean, I don't really know, but I, I would imagine that mom doesn't really get the school system and that that son was doing some of that, that interpretation work and then getting away with absences that she didn't know about. You know right. what I mean? Right. That's something that comes up a lot. So, yeah, it's, it's a difficult position. I mean, that's what I'm saying. The schools in New Jersey, there it's not just them. There's an infrastructure. It's not just the school. There are social service organizations, there's a healthcare clinic that has Spanish speakers, there's a number of different resources. So it's a it's an entire infrastructure with which a, a school is a part of that makes the difference, I think, between, you know, what I've seen in New Jersey and in Ohio and Northeast Ohio, not in Columbus, but where there's just not that same infrastructure. I think I saw another question over here, right? Yeah, I was wondering in, in general about the attitudes of uh Latino parents towards the school system, you know, in general, do they think that we are covering the right things in schools, that we do a good job handling discipline? And I'm just wondering, in gen I, I understand the insecurities about the language differences and so forth and interacting with schools and educators, but in general, do they think our approach to education is of value for their kids? Um, most definitely, I would say like in general, most definitely, a lot of the families I interview talk about wanting to stay here and have their kids raised here because 
because they feel like the schools are a lot better than the ones in Mexico. And sometimes I have to be honest, I'm like, really? Because I've been to schools in Mexico and some of them I thought haven't been that bad. And, you know, but there's, yeah, there's a huge, like, um, I think a, a general feeling, the very few people saying they prefer the schools in Mexico, almost none of them actually, none of the parents I've interviewed, they all feel like the United States is a good place to raise their kids. They want their children in the schools. You know, I've had parents in very poor performing schools say the same thing. They feel like the school's more structured and a better environment than what they came from. So I think in general there's that. You know, and then within that there's a lot of different parental preferences and comments about different school settings. I mean, that's that's more complicated. But I do think there's like this general idea that an education for their children in the U.S. is a good thing. Okay. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> So I teach first grade, and uh, so there was a, a, a couple of parents that were interested in having their kindergartner come to my room next year. So I think the, the thing about the signs in English and science is a good uh, tip. So I was just wondering, was there anything else that uh, I might consider in order to help make uh, the parents feel comfortable? Um, you know. I, I don't, I don't know specifically. I think the signs are a good thing. I mean, I don't know how, what you use as books and different things. I, I definitely noticed, you know, um, some of the classrooms I went to in Ohio weren't as well equipped in terms of cultural diversity. You guys are in Columbus. I think it's probably a bit different <laughs> in, than in some of the places I was in Ohio. But, you know, just the, the fact that uh, one of the schools I went in, you know, they've got books of not just Latino culture, but a lot of different culture. You know, there's books up there. The school that I was telling you in New Jersey that's that's got the PTO that's all the white parents that's worried about trying to get Latino families involved. You know what they've done? I thought it was kind of funny. They've, in that Scholastic, when they're selling the Scholastic books, they're bringing in all these books in Spanish. I think it's funny because the kids don't even want to look. I mean, none of the kids are going to buy those books. But, but I think that they're trying to do that so that the parents will come and be able to come in and see I don't know if it'll work, to be honest, but you can see that kind of level of effort going on. So I think just the books and the material and having some things uh, that look more multicultural may go a, a ways. I don't know. I could possibly ask them maybe to come in and teach a little bit of Spanish. Yes, you could have the parents come in and do a class. You know, the other thing. Uh, um, you're reminding me, you know, one of the parents I, I interviewed didn't want to, you know, said they had a preference for one, uh, a certain school. And the reason why, I said why, is she was district to a different school and sent her kids to a low-performing charter school instead. And I said, well, why did you do that? You know, that other school is actually a better school in terms of, um, I think it's, it's higher, uh, I don't know if it's better or not, but it's not a low-performing school. And um, she said that because they send everything home in English and Spanish. Now, that's definitely outside the capacity of many people, right? That's, a, that's not easy in that, you know, I don't know, each school, if, if you're dealing with an immigrant population from many different countries, that's impossible. But for her, what made the difference was being able to get a flyer home that had a little bit in Spanish, at least. I mean, I think that school sent home things pretty much bilingual. Like I said, these are challenges each school and district has to face on their own because they're different but I think uh, having some things in the home language go home or if maybe a number if you need to speak someone to someone in Spanish and there's a resource at your school that might help we do have a uh, we do have a Spanish uh, born teacher at my school yeah right so that is a resource and there are other adults at the building that speak uh, Spanish also yeah, maybe just something from the teacher saying if you need, you know, it's, it's interesting because like teachers are often the, the main contact. I, I say us parents because I have children myself. I mean, we, you know, you think of a school, sometimes you don't really know the principal. You know the, the teacher, really. That's your main. Um, and uh, you as teachers have so many other things you need to be doing rather than interfacing with the parents. So, you know, I just, that's all I Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other lasting questions? Oh, we can keep talking. Um, I can now move on to the oh, okay. issue of the, oh, go ahead. Have you, have you ever had any complaints uh, from parents of uh, their children being referred for special education services? Um, I've seen that sometimes where children, they may come in and they only speak Spanish for the most part, 
and maybe they're even in kindergarten or first grade, and um, the teacher will say, well, I can't understand, you know, so-and-so, and so because the school doesn't have a, have an ESL program, the teacher doesn't know what to do, so the teacher will refer uh, the child for uh, special education services, even though that's inappropriate. And uh, I was just wondering if you saw any um, uh, concerns or problems with that issue. That's a, an excellent point because I've heard a lot of complaints from school personnel about that and not so much from parents and I think the lesson I take away from that is parents don't really understand the school system enough to know to advocate for their children against that or for that, you know. So um, I, even in, in this area in New Jersey where I know a lot of, I, I've lived here for a long time so I know a number of teachers and they, I think they generally do a pretty good job but I've even heard a lot of complaints ESL teachers about kids getting misplaced in the special lab. There are a lot of kids in special ed in the district, you know, um, and they even have a newcomer's classroom that tries to adjust, um, to help kids adjust if they're way behind in their, um, in their school level from their country of origin. So if they fell behind, they can come into this classroom and have some catch-up time before they're thrown in to the wolves and could risk being misplaced. So I've heard a lot of complaints like, uh, of that from school personnel, but I don't know that parents are really in the position to advocate for, you know, to really understand that, to be honest. Um, I don't think they, I don't think parents understand the system well enough to feel that they can and complain if it's not going right, and a lot of the parents that, <clears throat> hey, maybe you've heard this in, in your discussions this week, but particularly in the case of Mexico, there's kind of a different attitude towards school where you respect that the school kind of knows. And I, a lot of people talk about it. I'm kinda, I kind of don't like to emphasize this point because I do, I find parents who are both ways, right? But, you know, there is, I think there is something to be said for kind of this culture of respect towards teachers where teachers kind of know what they're doing and this reluctance to get too involved. Um, and, you know, the parents I've interviewed, I've interviewed parents who do go in and get involved with their teacher. But when it comes to like special ed or the ESL program, a lot of lack of understanding of these specialized programs of the pull out, the push it, they don't, you know, gosh, I, I had a hard time understanding it as a researcher when I first came in because each district does it differently and there's different ways it works. And I think that um, parents come from uh, school systems where they don't have those types of programs. So they don't really under understand how that process works. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I've heard a lot of stories of from my parents with that kind of thing rather than complaints. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I did want to address one more theme, and this is good. I didn't, I, it's kind of short. I was a little worried this is good because I feel like we can kind of finish up uh, pretty quickly. Let's see what time it is. Um, I just have one more theme I wanted to introduce today, um, which is the theme of mobility. Um, I think this is a theme that researchers have not paid enough attention to. Um, due to family work situations, the fact that many immigrants rent, they're not homeowners, um, and their ongoing ties to their home communities in the country of origin, um, and also at times the possibility of deportation, immigrant families are typically quite mobile. They move around a lot. You probably have noticed this, in, or maybe you have, I don't know, in Columbus it may be different. In New Jersey, this is a huge problem. So I put up a quote from one of the ESL teachers I know in New Jersey when I interviewed her. She said, there are many situations in which uh, the parents move around a lot. There are situations in, parents, in which parents don't have a contact number. We don't even have a phone number for them. It's very difficult to be in touch with parents who just arrived. They don't have telephones. They rent rooms only. Sorry, there's a typo there. It's very difficult to get a phone number for them. Sometimes you want to communicate with them and you have to call three people before you can get in touch with the parent directly. I think that uh, because families are coming in in New Jersey, I don't know in Columbus what it's like actually. In New Jersey, um, the rent is extremely high, so families tend to rent rooms until they are economic, you know, they've been here for a while. So a family who's been here just a few years will rent a room and the entire family will live in a room. In Northeast Ohio, um, the cost of living is a bit lower, and so typically the families I interviewed were able to rent their own apartments and their own houses so that doubling up of families wasn't as common or or some families described doing that for like six months but it, it wasn't long standing right so um 
I think this, if you're renting a room, there's a, you know, and the room gets bed bugs. Man, we have a bed bug epidemic out here in the East Coast. You guys have, is that happening in Columbus? I don't remember hearing about it. So yes, yes, yeah, yes. It's just everywhere, man. So, um, so, you know, if you get bed bugs in the room you rent, we need to move rooms. And then, you, you know, teachers talk about students having to move. Uh, they move within the district, so they're another place to a different school, right? And this is this is a huge problem. Um, families also have these transnational ties, these ties in the country of origin. So um, a lot of times, older children may be sent back to their country of origin for a time, and it may be educational um, in purpose. You know, a parent decides they want the child to go back home, but. A lot of research suggests that older children are often sent back when they get in trouble in the United States. So if um, they have a boyfriend, they don't like, I knew a family like that, that she got a boyfriend, she got in trouble, so they sent her back from their grandma. Um, a lot of stories of Dominican families doing this, sending their kids back as a form of discipline for a time. And then among younger children, uh, parents may send them back um, because they want them to get to know their grandparents. Um, they may send them back because they suddenly have a child care problem, they, they become economically unstable, they have to work an extra shift, they don't have anyone to watch the kid, they send them back to grandma. Um, so there are a lot of instabilities, you know, I, I follow families over time and the families that I've interviewed, like, they move around, they're in different houses, they move to different states, different countries, I mean, it's amazing how fluid that, that experience is and how many moves go on. Um, how does this issue of mobility affect the school environment? Well, obviously the contact uh, with parents is, is difficult, but I think um, these stints in the home country um, can have a large impact on a child's education. Now, which way does it work? Is it good for kids or not? Uh, this one study in, of, of they're like uh, young adult immigrants, so their kids are already kind of grown up, um, but they, they, they interviewed a whole bunch of kids, lots of different countries of origin about their experiences going back home. Um, and they sort of suggest that these prolonged visits to going home, like being sent back for a year if they were getting in trouble, is actually an advantage that immigrants have, that immigrant youth have. So if a parent has their kid getting into trouble with a gang, they can send them back, they have the resources to get them out of the situation. And that actually is good for a child's overall educational pathway in their They suggest it's a good thing, but I have worked with younger kids, and I'm not sure I quite agree, because I think a year in the home country can completely derail a child's education and their schooling and the progress that they're making. I think this is really true for younger children, so for older kids maybe it does help, but for younger children, moving back and forth between school systems seems like it's a very difficult thing. You know, one boy I interviewed in Ohio, um, he was he did kindergarten here, was sent back to Mexico, did kindergarten, uh, you know, he didn't do kindergarten. He was sent back to Mexico to do kindergarten there. They wanted him actually to go to Mexico before he started school. They were thinking about it. So he did his kindergarten there, and then he came back to the U.S. and he did first grade, and they had him repeat because he was just too far behind. You know, I don't know in the long term if that will really affect his educational progress. Nowadays, a lot of kids repeat first grade, right? So maybe he'll be fine. But that idea that this stint back home really um, disrupts a child's educational pathway, I think is an important one that we need to think about. Um, I do want to return now to that topic of deportations, um, because I, I described earlier, you know, the scenario in which a father may be sent back, or a children experience a separation from their parents due to a deportation. But it's also true um, that due to these increased deportations, children are getting caught up in moving back and forth between countries as well. Um, there are a number of researchers in Mexico now looking at what happens when kids return from the U.S. school systems. They've done some years here. They go back to Mexico. Uh, often they get teased by other children for not really being Mexican and uh, there are a whole slew of issues that come up. <clears throat> but I think that this idea of when there's a deportation and that family instability that occurs with the deportation, children are moved back and forth. <clears throat> so I wanted to end with one example of that at um, instability <clears throat> from one of the families I interviewed in New Jersey. Um, the wife in the family is Dominican. Um, she's a U.S. citizen, though. She's naturalized. And the husband is Mexican and was deported. 
um, I think it was the part it now three years ago so it's been a while so for the first bit of time this is actually one of the few couples I know that's remained together as a as a couple even though they're living apart so in the first year or two she stayed with the kids taking care of them but um, he of course was not able to send her money from Mexico so uh, she found that taking care of her kids on her single income she's a daycare worker was just not enough it was impossible and then she lost their job and had to find a new job, so she didn't know what to do with the kids. So she ended up sending them to their father in Mexico. When she sent them, I believe the oldest was <clears throat> in uh, first grade and the, second, the other child was in kindergarten. They both were already in the school system here. She sent them back during the middle of the year because she didn't lose her job according to the school calendar. <laughs> she lost the job when she lost her job. Um, so they stayed for the rest of the school year with her father, that's this year, and now She's planning to bring them back as soon as she can. She just had having trouble living. You know, she hasn't seen her kids for seven months. She wants to see them. So she plans to bring them back, meaning the kids will now have to adjust again to a return trip to the United States to come back to new school once they're here. A different school because she's moved it since uh, she's moved districts since she had sent them. So that's an example of, of the children in a very short period of time, really we're talking about a year and a year and a half, having to adjust schools like three times. That's a, that's a big adjustment for children. <clears throat> so um, that's really all I had to share with you today. I, I wanted to summarize by just saying that I think if there's any message I wanted to give you, it's that these structures within the households have an impact that goes beyond the household, and I wanted to, I was, hopefully I've, I've shared some ideas about these structures in the household that you may not have thought about before. You know, the first being that these experiences of family separation um, are very common in immigrant families and, and can lead into the school environment. The second is that children and their U.S. born children have a different social status than their parents, and that these differences in social and legal status create uh, power dynamics in immigrant families that are different from those of children living um, in native-born families. And so again, these diff this, uh, this type of power dynamic leads into parents' <coughs> relationships in schools. And finally, um, what I just said briefly at the end was the idea of children's mobility, the fact that they're moving around, kids in immigrant families move around physically a lot and that that can present difficulties in adjusting to school systems and how schools can deal with it. So those are the, the three themes, and that's really all I have for you. I don't know if you have any more specific questions, and I also have, how much time do we have left? Are we, what are we looking at? As long as an hour, if you want it. Okay. Well, we what have, I did, if you guys have some more questions you want to discuss, and then I actually came up with a few questions. But I, that I thought we could talk about, because I'm curious to hear what your ideas are about them. But if you want to first have any other questions for me based on the, um, my research or the com you know, topics, yeah, I see somebody's hand. Um, we, uh, with, in, through conversations with our guidance counselor and records uh, secretary, um, we've noticed a general trend where uh, Latino students generally are older than their classmates. And I don't know, um, you know, some people have talked about birth certificates or whatever, but is this just maybe parents are registering their students at a lower grade level to make up for lost education? Or is there some other reason why um, they would be sometimes misrepresenting um, the student's age? When I think I missed a little up? piece of what you said because the, the sound went out. Oh, okay. You said something about the misrepresenting the ages. There seems to be a trend of the age being a little higher than other kids. Yeah. Is this? Do you think maybe this is, or have you found it to be because parents are trying to make up for lost schooling, or is there some other reason we haven't considered? So they're rec they're on record as being younger than they actually are. Yes. Okay. Like it'll they're come out later on that really they're 16 in eighth grade instead of 14, for example. And then okay. that's an extreme case, but just a year or so older than they should technically be in that grade. Now you're working in a in a high Mid school, middle school at this point. I was middle in a middle school. school. That's interesting. I don't really know. I haven't heard too much about that. I mean, I do know that um, 
in this district in New Jersey, where there's a lot of Latino students, there are a lot of age placements, but it's it's sort of the other way from what you're saying. They're older, but they're in lower grades because of where they are, where they test when they come in. They test way behind, <laughs> so they're placed. Um, you know, I do know that, I don't really know, you know, parents, um, I, I don't think here, the, the other possibility is that what you were suggesting is maybe they're aware that their kids can get more education if they, you know, more years of education, but I actually taught ESL in New Jersey, not as a certified teacher, but as a volunteer for, for a number of years. And I found that people didn't really know that. Like, the kids who are coming at that age are thinking about working, and we often had to, like, convince them not to work and that they could take advantage of the school system because they were too young to work. So that would surprise me that it goes that direction. The only thing I can think of is that sometimes parents don't have the right records for their kids. You know, in Mexico, at least, um, and I don't know about other countries, the kids actually birth certificate isn't registered when they're born necessarily if they're from a rural area. Uh, what happens is the child's born and then the, the guardian has to go in and, and register the child. So it can happen years after the child's actually born. So it's possible, depending on if they're coming from very rural, is it rural, or that, is it rural areas of Mexico, it's possible that there's kind of a document confusion um, particularly if there's parents been separated from kids for a little while, they may not be on top. So in other words, like the registered date for the birth certificate isn't necessarily the actual date the child was birth. You know what I mean? Yeah, so uh, it might I, just be paperwork issues, basically. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't know exactly where they're from or, you know, I know I've, I've seen that happen some, but I, I don't know. I mean, it would be interesting to me to think that parents have figured out that they can get their kids some more education if they, that's it, I mean, I, I, I haven't really heard of that, but hmm. possible. Thanks. Sure. Well, I do have one specific question about uh, transnational parents. What is the percentage of um, transnational parents versus the ones that um, just migrate and stay here? What percentage of them stay? Yeah, because, um, I mean, I work with transnational families in Chicago. Uh, so that is very common, the pattern that they will go back and forth and the kids yeah. will be um, in both school systems, and that's my research. But um, I know that in the area of Chicago, it's very common. What I don't know is, um, for, for example, in your research, um, are there more transnational families than non-transnational? The ones yeah. that just come and stay here because they either cannot afford the coyote fees or because they don't have, um, you know, papers to travel. So what is the percentage of those transnational parents versus the ones that just stay here? Yeah, well, I guess you, you know working in this field that I can't really give you a percentage because there are, there isn't really any national level data that captures this phenomenon, unfortunately. But I would say that in the group that I've been working with in New Jersey, um, where I did the study of the transnational families, most, I think, are, are there's a tendency towards settlement, probably what you're seeing in Chicago, where there's maybe a, a longer history in the United States within the family, and maybe they have papers. Is that true? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what I've, yeah. yeah, what I've seen in New Jersey is that uh, it's kind of been this short-term phenomenon when I study, which is families being here with their kids in Mexico, because uh, what's happened is it's increasingly difficult to cross the border yeah. so of course parents are staying now Nation nationwide we do know from mass Doug Massey's work that there's a tendency towards settlement among Mexican immigrants right less of the return migration and in New Jersey I've seen that happen with families so the parents that I've interviewed are not going back as much as they did even when I started the study in 2003 I heard a lot more stories of return migration among men uh, than at the end of 2006 and now that I'm back in the community what I've heard is that people aren't going back at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I suspect it's gotten worse. In fact, uh, I was having trouble. Um, when I went into New Jersey, I was, <clears throat> my plan was to interview kids who are US born and Mexican born. And that's what I did in Ohio. I started the workforce in Ohio. And in New Jersey, I was kind of having trouble finding any kids in that first, second, third grade age group who were born in Mexico. They exist, it's a big population, but a lot of people were reluctant to talk to me. And I found, and there weren't as many, I mean, I found loads of people to interview were Mexican, uh, where the kids were born in the U.S. 
Well, I actually was able to get school level data to find out that the newcomer kids are not as, there's not as many from Mexico anymore. They're mostly Dominican, actually, because there's been a change in visa stuff. And so now there actually isn't as many Mexican born kids arriving while they're young. And, uh, you know, I interviewed a couple of the mothers that, um, that I spoke with who have children in Mexico still who said they won't bring them anymore. They, it's off the radar because it's too dangerous. And what's happened with the drug cartels is in the community in New Jersey that I've been working with, most are from the Mixteco region, Oaxaca, Guerrero, um, uh, Puebla, and they're not traditional sending regions, as you know, in Mexico. So the, the coyotes were like mom and pop shops. Um, I've, like, I've like started thinking a little about them as like mom and pop shops, right? And with the big drug cartels, they brought them out of business. They don't do it anymore. It's too dangerous. So the people that they had in their communities that were trusted that could help them bring their children to the U.S. aren't doing it anymore. They're not risking it. The separations are going to be longer. I mean, that's what's happening here in New Jersey. Um, in fact, the two kids that I was able to interview <laughs> that I, you know, I specifically found, like third graders, um, one of them, uh, what did their, the mom said, it's actually an adopted mom, very complicated story, but they spent uh, $17,000 to bring the two kids, wow. and the other one, 14000 to bring two kids from Mexico. This is, uh, for those of you who don't, I don't know how much you know the others in the class about the usual cost, but in 2005, when I was interviewing families, like to bring kids and very safely an exorbitant amount would be about $5,000. So this is like, like triple. <laughs> What it, you know, and that's because of the drug cartels, basically. So I see less transnational movement because of that. Thank you. Well, Joanna, um, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Cindy Jang. I'm the evaluation manager at Office of International Affairs. And I, also, my research is on education as well. And you said you are not an you know, educator or in education. But you know, in education research, a lot of times we use the research to ask the question, what are the implications for you know practice? So I'm gonna you know so in your interview you spend a lot of time in schools and talking with the teachers and um, I was wondering if any of the schools you know asked you to provide any sort of advice for them or you know is there any you know you know uh, you know themes that you know stood out from your research that makes you very much concerned about the educate the you know immigrant children's education or the um, school conditions that these these students are, you know, um, getting educated. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I I have to say this is stuff that I'm I'm working on. I I would like to say in progress. And the study I did in Mexico, I felt very uncomfortable because the schools I were were, were I was in were in Mexico, and I don't, you know, I came in as an outside researcher from another country, without any real knowledge of the educational system in Mexico. It's not really what. I do. So uh, I felt very tentative about in making any recommendations or anything. But what I did when I, you know, when I went into the schools, the teachers all asked me, can you please do a presentation to our students because they all want to go to the U.S. Can you tell us, can you talk to them about the U.S.? So I did that because, you know, I'm interfacing with teachers. So I did what they asked. You know, I did some sort of uh, presentation to students. I told them that people in New Jersey live in basements. You know, I tell them about all the horrible conditions of my rooms. And, um, and I also pre prepared little reports for each of the schools about like what, what percentage of the kids had parents in the U.S. and just a couple little things about family separation. I ended up feeling in the end that I had a lot to say to Mexican schools, but it wasn't really my place because um, I felt like Mexican schools could cover migration in a very practical, concrete way, given the experiences of the students, and they weren't. You know, the textbook was like push and pull factors, and they didn't talk anything about kids' real experiences. But I wasn't really in the position, so I kind of just let it go, you know? And so now, in this new study I'm doing, I'm just now getting into the position. Now what do I do with my data? In Ohio, um, I, the schools I was in in Northeast Ohio, uh, basically, nobody asked me. Hmm. Uh, they were not interested. Oh. And I, I don't mean to say that to disregard them. They're not interested because this is a population, I mean, purposefully, I was interested in, in a population where there's not a, a place where there's not a lot of Mexican students. They're not interested because it's not on their radar. 
because they have one or two Mexican kids in their classrooms. You know, individual teachers did ask me questions about the families, but basically they don't view it as a problem that they need to deal with. In fact, the, you know, in, um, in Akron, they have a lot of refugee kids coming in from uh, Nepal, Bhutanese, Nepalese, refugee kids. So, so that's kind of where their radar is in terms of immigration. They're not thinking about Mexican kids. So I was kind of given access uh, when I was able to get it. And it was, I never had anybody ask me about my data. Now that I've come to New Jersey, I've just finished in kind of a six month whirlwind and I've been to six, uh, watch kids, six, kids here and six different kids. It's been really quick. Um, it's totally different here. Um, in New Jersey, because there's such a high, a high number, there's such a concentration of immigrant kids, first off, access was really difficult for me to get. I had to get the superintendent's permission. I couldn't get principal's permission like I did in other schools. I had to go to the superintendent and get a meeting, a personal meeting with him, which fortunately I was able to get because I knew people. I mean, it was really difficult. And it's because schools here are worried about funding they're worried about being attacked for not dealing with their bilingual students well enough. They're, you know, it's a bad environment right now for teachers. It's a bad environment for teachers in New Jersey. And it's a bad environment for school districts that are having trouble for, in their performance indicators because of the large number of ELL students. So it was hard to get in. And once I've gotten in, the, everybody's sort of interested now that I have the support of the superintendent, they all are interested in my research findings. So I kind of got it to get it together. I'm talking to you guys. I've just finished. I was in the last school, like the last week of classes, like a week ago, because here it goes late. Um, so I'm pulling together my findings now and trying to figure out what I can what I can do that will be useful to the school. But trying to be very mindful that I, you know, I'm not. I know I'm not really answering your question of what. What can we do? And that's why I thought I'd rather do it in a discussion format with you guys and get your ideas. But I don't feel as a as a sociologist that my position is is to comment about kids' education. I told you know part of my deal in going in is that's not what I'm there to watch. I'm not there to evaluate you on how you're educating your bilingual students. I'm there to learn about how you dealt with these issues. So I really don't want to talk to them about it. I don't plan to. What I will present to them is other findings I have. You know, one thing I found was that the kids in New Jersey talked about being teased for being Mexican all the time. And I was like, why? There's all these Mexican kids in your school. I don't get it, you know? In Ohio, I didn't hear stories of being teased. But in New Jersey, I did. So that's something interesting that I, I will be able to um, offer up to the schools. Mm -hmm. um, I have a paper I'm writing about how uh, deportation affects children, even those who don't have anybody deported in their family. That's the kind of thing I, I plan to present to schools. I want to share my findings. They've asked for them, but I have this, you know, agreement that I'm not there to evaluate education at all. Okay. So I know I'm not really answering your question. Well, but yeah. Well, it's, that's exactly why I'm asking this question because mm -hmm. you are uh, in a different situation, one in the you know, Mexico area and one in the U.S. And then people obviously perceive you very differently in both, you know, in, in you know, each country. And then um, uh, I guess it's an, another dilemma that a lot of education researchers face as well, how you utilize your data or your, yeah. your know, findings and how you, you know, translate that into practice. Yeah. And another just follow up with what you said about is, um, and since a lot of us are you know educators within you residing in Ohio, I'm wondering if you noticed that I don't know the demographics of Akron area, but have you noticed that you know in a lot of schools where they are promoting diversity and you know um, value diversity, have you noticed that kids from Latin uh, American communities, um, Mexican you know uh, immigrants. Um, they are how they you know being included in this whole diversity you know mission. Yeah, I, I I do have some comments. You know, I first I wanted to say like I'm trying to avoid giving feedback to the schools about educational practices, but I can't help observe, and I'm a parent myself. I, I tell people you know friends who I'm talking to about it. As a parent, I've seen now a number of different schools. I've seen the difference in quality in education. I have lots of comments and thoughts. <laughs> So I, I kind of have to balance that. You know, one thing in terms of diversity I, that you brought up, one thing I've noticed is that in the Akron schools, there aren't a lot of people of color working there. 
uh, a couple of the schools had African American principals, which is great, but I, I saw very few other staff members of um, different uh, racial and ethnic groups. In New Jersey, one of the schools that I said has kind of created the safe space, I think more than half, I don't have the actual numbers, but just in what you see, more than half of the staff are uh, Spanish speakers. Now this is a problem of like training and recruitment. I mean, it's, it's a problem that goes beyond the individual school and like what's available. You know, it's, it's a big issue, but I think that matters for kids in that environment of feeling included or excluded. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed in Ohio, and one of the things I, I do think I will write about um, is how the children that I interviewed, um, Mexican children, feel they don't get teased for being Mexican, but they feel excluded a lot because there's so few of them and there isn't a lot in the school environment that makes them feel included. I think there are individual teachers who do what they can, for sure. I met many teachers who were really inclusive. I met some excellent teachers, you know, uh, really impressed. But uh, I think in general, the school environment is not really set up. I mean, again, they are in a place where there are one or two Mexican kids per grade, per class, not a lot of them. So creating an environment that's inclusive is a, is a bigger challenge. But the kids that I interviewed felt excluded in Ohio, yeah. They did not interact. You know, one of the things I'm looking at is how often do they initiate interaction with a teacher or with their peers? And the kids that I observed almost across the board there's, uh, are not initiating interaction with the teacher or their peers as much as the kids in New Jersey who just seem regular, you know, more of the milk kids. They feel comfortable. You can tell they just feel comfortable like they own the classroom, whereas the kids that I was observing in Ohio tended to see, to be different and to feel different. Um, you know, one of the boys I observed in Ohio, I would say, he wasn't exactly like that because he was a bit of a troublemaker. He was initiating with other boys, but to get in trouble, and the other boys wouldn't play with him. So he's sort of excluded. You know, it's an, you know he's excluded in a different way. So I think there's a lot more of exclusion going on in the Ohio setting. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, more. it does. I tend to ramble sometimes. Yeah, okay. no, 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 that's very interesting finding. Thank you. The questions that, I mean, unless somebody else has another question, I, I came up with questions because I want to hear what your ideas are. Um, so I really just have three questions. They're very basic, um, drawn based on my presentation. But I'm interested to hear what you guys as a group think um, that individual teachers can do to be sensitive to children's experiences of family separation or what individual um, schools or school districts can do kind of to deal with this issue of family separation. Are there things that you guys have seen or have done or, I think that's like the first question. I, and then I obviously have the same question in terms of mobility and the mixed status families. But I wanted to start with this idea of family separation. Like, what can one do <laughs> in a concrete level in your classroom or perhaps at the district level or or you know, suggest at the district level or just at the school policy level? First, we need to be aware of it. Uh, if we don't know anything about the separation issue and how it affects the students, then we can't address it. So I would say at the school's level, uh, we need to have some type of in-service that would be sort of like this experience that we're having this week, but at a broader level and at individual schools, especially in the schools that have higher numbers of uh, Latino students so that the teachers are aware and then can strategize what type of interactions or programs can be implemented in each school to address it and at least identify it. So do you think that, yeah, do you think that, I mean, in Columbus or in the school you're in, people are aware of this idea of separation occurring or not really? I don't think so. Um, in one of the schools where I was, the, the mobility, that's evident um, because, and not just with the Latino students, but with the, the entire population because it's a poor, uh, economically poor school. But as far as mobility because of separation, that kind of thing, I don't believe we're aware of it at all. Yeah. Um, it I think on an individual basis in the classroom, when we talked about the power struggles, 
I think just an open dialogue with all of the students who end up being in charge of themselves after they leave school, just talking about what our roles as people are outside of school and then what their role as a student inside of the building is, just to, if nothing else, make them aware that it's different outside of school than inside of school, just like it's different my job inside of school or it, at work, how you have a different role at work than you do in your own house. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You made me, your comment makes me think that it's kind of interesting because I think we do a lot, or I don't know, you guys in school, you guys are in school, but my perception is that we do a lot to get children to be responsible for themselves, right? You know, kids are, you know, the classrooms I'm in, they're doing independent reading, a lot of independent work now, trying to get kids to be responsible and to kind of take on. And then, you know, there's that clash between when at home, are they independent, are they responsible for siblings, are they not? You know, like, I, I like your idea of this idea that in the classroom, kids are kind of, you know, this is your role, role. And at home, your role could be one or another, or you could be, like, dependent on your parent. You know, there's a lot of different forms in the family. There's a lot of different types of roles kids play in families. They don't all come from the same kind of family. Yeah. I think um, uh, uh, also maybe we need to sort of try and understand uh, how do uh, little girls as opposed to little boys respond to uh, uh, authority when it comes to a male teacher or a female teacher, for example? Yeah. Uh, when they're very young. Yeah, have uh, you seen that come up in your classroom? Well, I had kind of forgot about this. It's probably a little embarrassing, but about 12 years ago, uh, there was, a, and I taught first grade, there was a, a Mexican family and their little daughter was assigned to my classroom, but she saw me and screamed and ran out of the room. <laughs> and she refused to come back into the classroom, so they, uh, there were other first grade classrooms, but they took her out of the school. So, That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> she screamed and ran out. Um, yeah, you know, that's, it's something that I, I haven't, um, like I said, I'm just finishing data collection with this new project and I haven't really gotten into uh, this, but I'd like to, this idea of the gender differences between boys and girls and what they need. And I am looking at first, second, third grade, kind of these younger age groups. And um, thank you, I don't, you know, I wouldn't have an answer or anything, maybe somebody else does, but, but it's true. Like, what is the, you know, what is the different dynamic? Um, for girls and boys. Uh, one of the boys I was watching most recently, they were having a lot of difficulty with him. He's quite the little, he's, he has behavior problems. They've even brought somebody in to observe his behavior. I don't think he's got an issue whatsoever. I think he's just a difficult child. You know, I don't think he's got behavior problems. I don't really know, but, um, <clears throat> but they described him as being this little macho Mexican man. And one of the ESL teachers said, you know, <clears throat> they told him boys need to do this. And he looked at her and said, I'm not a boy, I'm a man. <laughs> and she's just describing how much trouble she was having. And his classroom teacher, he's, a bi he's in a bilingual class, she speaks Spanish, but she, she's sort of a young, a new, inexperienced teacher. Um, and she's having a lot of trouble as being this young woman kind of dealing with him. She, the ESL teacher was like, man, he needs like a strong guy to kind of whip him into shape or something. So I think these gender <laughs> dynamics are very important, but, um, Something I'm going to keep looking into. Thanks. Yeah, I've been, I am concerned. Maybe you can help me. Um, New Jersey, an urban mm -hmm. area, as far mm -hmm. as uh, mobility and diversity compared with. Uh, do we have higher population of Somalians in New Jersey, or do we have higher population of uh, Somalians in urban area? And you know, do you see as far as diversity and mobility? If we know that. Of, I'm sorry, I went out. Higher population of what? The population of uh, Somalians is. Oh, Somalians. All right. Oh. And the issue of you know refugee and you know migration, you know yes. the whole issue of you know what is really happening in Akron, you know what's yeah. really happening and in New Jersey, knowing that New Jersey is so close to New York, diversity in New York. Diversity in Akron and Ohio be a central area. We have some political power. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. So it's very different. I mean, part of that's part of the reason I've set up my study this way because I want to look at how Mexican children navigate different places, right? 
But in New Jersey, there's not, it's not a settlement place. You know, they're not bringing in, actively bringing in refugees. There's no refugee resettlement program in New Jersey. There's a huge amount of diversity of immigrants, self-selected immigrants coming in uh, for work. I mean, there's all different countries. This is <clears throat> New Jersey and New York have some of the highest diversity rates of immigrant groups themselves because there are people from all different countries all over the place. Um, <clears throat> Just an anecdote, because I'm, I'm actually in the town neighboring the one I'm observing in. My children moved into schools here, and I think my, my younger one was in a pre-K program. Uh, there was only two families in his class that you might consider to be traditional white families. Every other family, Russian, nobody, there was no concentration from any group. There were a couple Mexican kids, one Peruvian, there are two Chinese kids. I mean, they're all over. It's so diverse. There's no... Uh, New Jersey is such a different uh, uh, environment. And the, the place I was in was obviously concentrating the Mexicans because that's what I wanted to look at. In Akron, it's the refugee, like as you pointed out, they have a lot of, their, I think it's Burmese and Bhutanese Nepalese that are being resettled in the area. Um, I think a lot of the Mexican kids are actually sometimes misidentified as being uh, Burmese, Nepalese, or Bhutanese, you know, whatever, one of the refugee groups. Um, there's also some resentment between uh, Mexican immigrants in the area who are undocumented and those who are refugees who have a whole slew of other resources available to them and, and uh, Latino immigrants to the area who don't. They're not able to access the same social services. There aren't social services available. In fact, in one of the schools I went to, I asked the teacher, who wasn't, she wasn't one of those teachers that's particularly knowledgeable on the, on the topic or interested. But I said, you know, the kid that's in your class, can he go to extra tutoring? Isn't there some program? And she's like, oh yeah, you know, the Nepalese kid, or she didn't, I don't remember what she called them. She said, they get some tutoring, he could go there, you know, but he can't because he's not a part of that program. So she didn't even know. So that's, uh, you know, they're, in a way, they're not really comparable populations in New Jersey and Ohio, but that's what I'm looking for. That's what that's the purpose of my study, is to kind of look at two settings that are very different. Mm -hmm. So as for Columbus, I that's where you guys come in to try to relate what I'm saying to the Columbus environment, because I don't know Columbus either. Yeah, um, one of the things I was thinking about as an individual teacher and how I might approach dealing with these kind of issues is I was thinking about the difference between elementary and high school. Because I, I started out uh, teaching elementary school, and now I teach high school. And one of the big differences, as an elementary teacher, you know, I had 20, 25 students, and I had them pretty much all day, and so I could really get to know them, know their families, and so it was a lot easier to identify you know, important issues and work with those kids on those issues. But now as a high school teacher, you know, I'll have 130 students, and it's a lot harder to, you know, get, you know, I can't get to know all of them. Um, right, right. And for one, that points out to me the need for high school teachers to communicate more among themselves because I might get to know this kid that the other teachers haven't really gotten to know and they've gotten to know kids I don't really know. And so with identifying some of these issues and figuring out strategies of how we can best help these kids with whatever issues they might be dealing with, on the high school level that that communication between teachers as well as counselors, administrators, I think is, is really important. Um, but also that, in my experience, is very often lacking in high schools. You know, as, as a teacher, it's easy to become very focused on your classroom and what you're doing. And you know, we always have more than enough for to do just in our own little classroom. Um, that then to take the time to communicate with each other about you know how we can help different kids sometimes. Um, that doesn't happen as much as it could. And so that's, that's one thing I think would be helpful if on the high school level there were structures within the school set up that would help facilitate that kind of communication on, on how to help some of these kids. Do, do others of you have similar experiences or feeling, I mean, I don't, are there structures that exist in some schools that do that? I, don't, I would have no idea. There, there are some. I, I worked in a school where we set up a um, basically a mentoring kind of program where we took all the kids and split them up among the teachers. So I had my group of you know 15 kids, 
um, that I would focus on and another teacher had a different group of kids. And so that way you'd have it so no kids would fall through the cracks because that's one common problem in high schools is there's kids that nobody gets to know. You know, they're the quiet kid, they're not involved in activities, and so nobody ever gets to know them and know the struggles they deal may, may be dealing with. Um, so there are some kind of programs like that. I'm sure there's probably others that other people yeah. experience. Um, I also yeah. think that on a global situation, um, Columbus may not have enough parents to have PTAs, Spanish-speaking PTAs in each school, but I think we can have, um, you know, the east side Spanish-speaking PTA where, um, specifically on the east side of Columbus, um, Spanish-speaking families follow a feeder pattern into a high school, and it would be really valuable for at the middle school or high school or elementary level, parents had a PTA. PTA where they all could go to together. So I think in Columbus, uh, a PTA would be really valuable, if not on the school level, at least on the That's a great idea, it's not the school, but kind of in the region. So they could, yeah, a good solution to their not, not being a concentrated population. I also yeah. think, though, that school districts pick and choose their battles. And right now, um, I think they feel pretty comfortable with dealing with the Latino culture in our schools and you know we can somehow relate to this but Columbus has had this huge influx of Somali people and we're the second largest Somali um, population in the United States behind Minneapolis and it kind of hit the school district you know just boom here here they are what are we going to do with this mm -hmm. so yeah. the focus for the district is that right and right because we're comfortable with Latino culture and whatnot, that's not the real focus. So I guess our question as educators is what can we do to, or to make that more important to them? Because you know, we want to educate everybody. But the right. Somali thing is a whole new culture that no one understands. The Latino thing, yes, we can relate to. Right, right. But the Somali is completely different. Can we do diversity, considering Somalians, Latinos? Can we go into the stage of uh, diversity, PTO? Mm -hmm. sure. It's interesting because uh, as a you know immigrant myself, a lot of things that Joanna um, shared in her findings uh, ring bells ring a bell to me because a lot of things that you know. There are similarities in terms of the separation, mobility. A lot of you know, you know, education of children. Many immigrants across different ethnic and racial groups they face similar challenges and issues. So in some ways, there are you know ways you can incorporate you know different groups of you know immigrants in one educational study, like you know what she suggested about regional PTA. That you can have one group of you know uh, Latino PTA and then another one. Group and they can share information and on you know you are right again on at some other levels there are some differences as well and I think uh, it's something that you know uh, we're exploring and you know yeah yeah I, and these are all excellent ideas it seems to me that <clears throat> that it's uh, it's finding the similarities from being foreign born, right? That, yeah. <clears throat> that might be the best way to go when it's a population where there's not a lot, one concentration of one group, right? Is finding the common ground of, of all beings. So maybe finding those similarities between the Somali. So there's loads of differences, like I said, with the refugee um, in Akron, the families feeling like the refugee families have a very different situation economically, which they do, but there is also common ground, the separation. Mm -hmm. uh, the types of family structure moving around a lot within within mm -hmm. the city because you're a new, newly arrived person. You know the power struggles. I think those things cross over. You know, often in my research, mm -hmm. I try to, as I write, I try to point out how those experiences also occur in families that are native born. You know, mm -hmm. I have power struggles with my kids too. Mm -hmm. I just moved them from Ohio to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Now I know what it's like to drag your kids to meet your school system. I mean. We, these are things that we all experience, and then there's certain things about the immigrant experience that are slightly different, but they can, you know, there are some universals there that I think one can work against yeah. around, mm -hmm. try to find common ground around. Mm 
especially when it comes to education, in my research of you know, foreigners who are getting educated in the United States, it's very interesting that I found that they share, they have a shared foreignness in a sense that they are all dealing with this United, you know, new education system in the United States, and therefore they are more easily, you know, they can identify which other, you know, more so than our, you know, us as outsiders can imagine. So a lot of times, uh, they, you know, I find, you know, for, especially for international students, they would go to each other, whether you're from Africa, from, you know, um, Latin America, they are, you know, sharing more information, more, you know, commonness among themselves than, you know, we would think. So it's probably, you know, similar in it, you know, I don't know, you know. Yeah, I like that term shared foreignness. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, going back to the similarity, you know, we talk about birth certificates, you know, being concerned the age, you know. We also have to see, you know, the Somalian group that we are here in Ohio. These are a um, group of people that have been in a refugee camp in Kenya. And, they, you know, when they come here, some of them, they don't know anything about where they were born, who their parents are, because they have been for 10 or 12 years in refugee camp no, in Kenya, and they have been sent as a group here in Ohio. So, you know, we have to keep the similarities as a very key point for us to work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I Thank you very much for your Oh, well, thank time. you. I hope it was thought-provoking. I learned a lot from hearing from you guys, so thanks. Good. <laughs> thank you. Good luck with the rest of the week. <laughs>